How many are happy to be in the house of the Lord? Good. Me too. Pastor Nita called me. I think it was probably Thursday night. I just lost track of the days. When you're retired, one day kind of runs into another day and another day and another day. <laughs> I know what day Sunday is because we come to the house of the Lord. But after that, they all kind of run in and feel the same. Uh, yeah, so she's developing wonderful immunities at home today. So glory to God. There's good coming out of what's taking place in their lives. And uh, so she sends her blessing and uh, she says she's praying for you. As you know, she is. Amen? As you know, she is. Danielle, can you sit with, with your dad? I'm going to want to look over there. Can I ask you to sit with your dad? Keep him company. I'm a mom. I'm still ordering my kids around. You can do it. Then I can see your smiley face. So glory to God. When she asked me if I would talk, I just said, yep. And the thing that came to mind was what I had been thinking about in the Word. And I thought, well, I can talk about that. I don't know whether you're going to be interested or not, but it's what interested me. And I'm a teacher, so I'm going to do some teaching today. I'm not like Pastor Nita. She's got a prophetic flow. Um, but me, I like to teach, and um, that's what God has done in me from day one. As soon as the Holy Spirit came into me, I couldn't help myself. And it's really funny getting around people that have that same calling and have that on the inside of them, because we just end up teaching one another all the time. You know, it's like my brother Johnny, when I danced with him for the first time, we were so much in built alike that we just kept knocking knees when we were dancing the whole time. I never danced with anyone like him before. And uh, we just knock knees, knock knees, knock knees. And I think that's what it is when you have a similar gift. You're just, we're, you're dancing, but you're still knocking knees. Anyways, glory to God. That's me trying to be funny. Hallelujah. Well, let's just pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the word. I'm going to do my best to deliver it. And I pray, Father, we'd have ears to hear what the Spirit's saying. We love you and we praise you. We give you all the glory. And we thank you we have this treasure in earthen vessels. We have your Holy Spirit on the inside of us. And Holy Spirit, you're the one that searched out the heart of the Father, and you reveal it to us. So I pray today a revealing, an unveiling of the word, an unveiling of mysteries that are hidden in Christ. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Well, glory to God. I'm doing a new thing here. I'm doing my, I, I'm sounding like somebody that's really techy, but I'm not. But I put my word on the iPad. It's just much easier to gather information and collect it from here to there. So hopefully I won't struggle with it too much. So if you don't see me going to my Bible, it's not because I haven't gone to my Bible. <laughs> I'm just following it in on my iPad. Amen? So what God put in my heart is about mysteries. You ever wonder what a mystery is? What's a mystery? Did anybody like a, a murder mystery or a mystery on TV? Anyone drawn to, to mysteries, searching out mysteries? I think that's sort of something that we all can get hooked into. We can, get, we can, we can find it interesting. I, I know I have. Um, and Proverbs 25, 6, 2 says that it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search out a matter. And I don't know about you, but I've discovered that God likes to conceal things. He doesn't make things obvious to us, always. Even to his disciples, when he was preaching Jesus, and he spoke in parables, his disciples came to him and they said, why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered and he said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. And it sounds like Jesus is trying to withhold something from them. But he's saying there's an order to things. He says, I'm going to speak the mysteries, and you're going to have to study it out and learn it, and then you're going to teach it to them. But in the meantime, I'm speaking to them in parables. And if they truly have ears to hear, I don't know about you, but a picture is worth a thousand words. Right? You get a parable, a story, it can keep talking to you. Keep talking to you. So he wasn't saying to the people around him, I'm giving you something second rate. But he was saying to his disciples, I've called you 
to dig into mysteries and to find some mysteries. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to be like the disciples of old. We're going to dig into some mysteries. Amen? All right. Well, we're going to talk about Paul today because we're going to look at his mysteries. Paul had a revelation of mysteries that no one else had. And where did he get those mysteries? Well, he was someone that was called of God to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Didn't start out that way. He started out as a religious churchgoer. He or synagogue goer. Shouldn't say a church goer. He was a Jewish boy that was raised and he was very well schooled, very well educated in all things pertaining to religion, the Jewish religion. Right? And he felt so strongly about what he knew, he was willing to persecute the early believers. And these believers were ones that began as believers on the day of Pentecost that Pastor Anita has been teaching us about. That wonderful time when the Holy Spirit came down on the disciples first and then went out to lots of Jewish people that were gathered in Israel. So right away, it was spilling over and spilling over. It started with them. Now Paul... He didn't like very much what was going on in Jerusalem. There were people that were turning away from what he thought was the truth. Don't you find that even today? There's lots of people that are hanging on to truth, and they're willing to almost kill you and destroy you to stop you from believing your truth. Amen? Amen. It's been around since time began. Cain and Abel, you go through one truth and another truth, and there's death that comes of it. Well, Paul, when he was journeying on the road to Damascus, after he'd been persecuting the church, he had an encounter with Almighty God. He had a Holy Ghost encounter. God knocked him off of his donkey. We all know that story. Knocked him off, blinded him, and then spoke to his heart. But the wonderful thing about Paul was that he didn't reject. How many people have been knocked off a horse and just said, "Ah, you resist God still, you go your own way. He was willing to alter his course. He was willing to change direction. But it came out of a very difficult time. There he is, blind, and changing course, and knowing that everything that he had believed, all the people that he had persecuted, imprisoned, put to death, was going in the wrong direction and wasn't serving God at all. He turned almost on a dime. He made a decision that he was going to follow, follow this Jesus that had been revealed to him in an amazing way and wants to reveal himself to each one of us in a very amazing and personal way. And if we're walking in pride and going in the wrong direction, God knows how to deal with each one of us. He knows how to knock us off of our donkeys, our asses, and put us where we need to be. Amen? Amen. That's the wonderful love of the Father. He disciplines his children. And uh, while there was Paul, he didn't go immediately, it says, to the disciples to find out what they were doing. It says that he separated himself, and he went to Arabia instead. And he said he spent three years in Arabia. You think when he got born again, he'd just want to link up with other people that were like-minded. But he said, "Uh uh-uh. He had a different course completely. He was following something new on the inside. And I don't think it was any accident at all that he ended up in Arabia for three years. And he was schooled by the school of the Holy Ghost there. Amen? He spent three, he says, I I didn't go and ask for anybody's opinion. He says, I wanted God's opinion. And while he was away, the Bible tells us that he had amazing encounters. He was actually taken up, caught up into the third heaven. And things were spoken to him that he said was almost too wonderful to speak. It was too amazing. Well, I guess so. 
And out of that was birthed a love for what Paul spent the rest of his life doing was building up the church. Building up the church. The church had never been before. This was something that was new that came out of the baptism of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Prior to that, it had been Israel, synagogue. You could come under the covering, but you still had to be like a good Jewish person. You had to follow their rules and regulations. But now something new came out of that. It was the mystery of the church. And the church really was a mystery to everyone at that time. You know, we go to church, we talk about church, just church, this church, that. We go to church, what church do you belong to? It's our language. It's our church lingo. But it sure wasn't at the time when Paul started. He had to get some revelations of what this church was all about. But it was very interesting. Now I'm going to just take you a little side note here. Because Paul was called to preach to the Gentiles this learned, learned man, and you're going to see this in these mysteries that we look at. He's going to refer again and again to the Gentiles, right? But Jesus said in Luke, uh, let me see. It doesn't matter. It's in Luke. I'll get to it. might be over on the other page. I thought it was on this page, but it doesn't matter. He said that there's a, a, t a time of the Gentiles need to be fulfilled. He said the Gentiles have an expiry date. Have you ever looked at food on the shelf and said, hmm, and your fridge has got an expiry date? He referred to something as a time of the Gentiles. Well, the Gentiles, their journey began as part of the church. That was the revelation. They were part of this new thing. There was the nation of Israel, and now there was a believer in Jesus. And they were the Gentiles. And Paul, he teaches that he made one new man out of them both. There was neither Jew nor Gentile. You got to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. So it wasn't about Jew or Gentile. And you, most of you people are Gentiles. Maybe some of you have Jewish heritage. I don't know. But it doesn't matter, because what you are, if you've accepted Christ, is a new creature in Christ Jesus. And after the destruction of Jerusalem, in Luke it talks about, Jesus says um, there's going to be a time of the Gentiles has to be fulfilled. There's a time period when it's going to be fulfilled. There's going to be an ending to the time of the Gentiles. Well, isn't that an interesting concept? And Paul teaches that very same thing, which we will see in a few minutes. All right? So there's an expiry date for what you and I call the church. Do you know that? I don't know whether you've heard that before or not, but Jesus said he's coming back for his bride. Who are you? You're his bride. Amen. He says he's coming for you. And in John, when he was speaking to the disciples before he went to the cross, he actually talked marriage to them. He says, in my father's house are many mansions. He, he spoke marriage contract. He says, You're my, I'm coming back for my bride. So the bride began with the church. The church is his bride, which has an expiry date because he's going to be coming back for his church. And that's one of the mysteries. Okay. Now, I'm going to just list the mysteries to you. I don't know how far I'm going to go with the mysteries. But what the Lord showed me is that I better take my watch off. I don't want to go too long. Hallelujah. What he showed me is that the mysteries are kind of like a pomegranate. Now, I don't know about you, but my husband loves pomegranates. When he gets a pomegranate, you already know what a pomegranate is. And actually, pomegranates were in the old covenant temple. They put pomegranates everywhere in gold pomegranates. There was pictures of pomegranates everywhere. So I think it's a, a pretty interesting analogy to use here with the mysteries. Um, my husband, Doug, when he gets his pomegranate, he sits there and it takes him a while to get the seeds out of the pomegranates. 
And we end up with juice all over our kitchen and on the blinds and on the floor. And we have little, little seeds rolling here, there, and everywhere. And I can step on them later and find them. But, but that, that's kind of like what the mystery is. So when I give you a mystery, and I tell you the mystery, just think of it as a pomegranate. There's lots of seeds on the inside. And you're going you're gonna to take a long, long time. Of one subject that I give you, one pomegranate that I give you has all that fruit. So one mystery, it's going to take a long time to search it all out. And we certainly aren't going to do that today. But what I want you to see with these seven mysteries that Paul has given us, that he had revelation of, it really speaks of this time of the Gentiles, which has a beginning and an end. See, he was given to the church as a gift to give understanding of what the mysteries are in Christ about the church, about what it's all about. So are you interested in the mysteries? All right. All right. Well, I'm going to give them to you. There's seven. Okay, and I'm just going to read them all to you one at a time. I'm going to give you the scriptures. I don't know if any of you write these down or not, but I'm going to give them to you. It's the mystery of the Incarnation. And that's in 1 Timothy 3.16. That's one. The mystery of the blindness of Israel. That's Romans 11.25. The mystery of the church. Ephesians 3.1-10. The mystery of the indwelling Christ. Colossians 1.24-27. The mystery of the headship of Christ. Am I going too fast? Where are you? (laughs) You're on number one. The mystery... The mystery of the incarnation. 1 Timothy 3.16. Put your hand up when you're ready to go to the next one. Mystery of the blindness of Israel. Romans 11.25. You got this, Steve? You getting it all down? Good. The mystery of the church. Ephesians 3.1-10. Got that? Okay. Number four. The mystery of the indwelling Christ. Colossians 1, 24 to 27. The mystery of the headship of Christ. Ephesians 5, 22 to 32. The mystery of the translation of the church. 1 Corinthians 15, 50 to 57. And the mystery of lawlessness. Ah, that's 2 Thessalonians 2, 7. I found out where Luke was. It's on this page. It was Luke 21, 24. Jesus said they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And Romans 11:25 says, I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So I wanted you to see that there was this expiry date of the Gentiles. So now back to the mysteries. Now you can take your pomegranate and you can dig in as deep as you want. Right? You can. I double dog dare you. I do. Don't let this just be a revelation that comes to me. Let this be a revelation that comes to you. If Paul went up to the third heaven and received this revelation, these mysteries, I think it does us justice if we would be the ones to pursue it and dig in a little deeper. 
Um, because you know what? God's not going to do it all for you. Right? It, it, it's the desire. We sang that song, I love you more than gold and silver, only you... Yeah, well, that's one thing to sing it. It's another thing to mean it and do it. Right? It's easy to sing a song. It's another thing to walk out this journey and really be truthful about it and dig in. Because God is not going to do it for He does not pamper us. He does not always make it easy for us. Can everybody say amen? All right. Amen. Okay. The mystery of the incarnation. And I'm going to read the scripture to you. 1 Timothy 3.16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Now, you think he was talking about the mystery of godliness, but he goes on to say, it's, And without controversy, okay, God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, and here goes Paul, preached among the Gentiles. He has to get that in, because he wants you to see that this is for the Gentiles. Preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in glory. Okay, what does it mean that God came in the flesh? What does it mean? Doesn't that blow your mind away that God came in the flesh? Wow. I'm, I'm going to go right here because I think it's important. I had this kind of prepared. Didn't know whether I was going to go there or not, but I'm going to. Uh, there was a man, and his name is um, Ronald Wyatt. He's kind of like a modern-day Indiana Jones. Write the name Ronald Wyatt down. Ronald Wyatt, W-Y-A-T-T. -T. You can go on YouTube, and you can look up things that he has been a part of. He Now, he died in 1999. But he was a modern-day Indiana Jones, hunting for treasure. His whole heart was to serve God, and he wanted to prove that the Bible was accurate, that when the Bible said there was a Noah's Ark, he wanted to prove that there was a Noah's Ark. And when the Bible said Pharaoh and his army fell into the Red Sea, he wanted to prove that archaeologically, and he spent his own time and money doing that. Just a, a, a humble man of God. Well, so some of his, his, his YouTube videos are on that. Doug and I watched one on, on Noah's Ark pursuing Noah's Ark, and he believes he found the place where Noah's Ark was positioned. You can take it or leave it. You don't have to believe it. Now, you don't have to believe what I'm going to say to you next either. Right? You, you don't have to believe. But what happened to him, he was in Jerusalem, and he was walking along in Jerusalem, just minding his own business, just touring through Jerusalem, looking at the sites of Jerusalem. And he came to an area where there was rocks and what not. And he said he found himself walking along and then he looked, he sees his hand raised and he pointed to, he says, the Ark of the Covenant's in there. He said the heart Ark of the Covenant's there. Well, he wasn't looking for the Ark of the Covenant. That, that wasn't even on his heart. He wasn't in search. He was the Noah's Ark man. He was Pharaoh and his army. But he said God did something on the inside of him. He says, well, if God said it's there, I'm going to go pursue it. I'm going to go look for it. Well, this was in 1978. He dug a long time. He spent his own money. His sons came with him. And he started digging where he felt God said, go. Point where the Ark of the Covenant is. Why is it so important to look for the Ark of the Covenant? Anybody have any idea? Because hmm? the presence of God. Well, Ezekiel tells us there's going to be another temple. The one was destroyed 70 AD, but there's going to be another one that's going to be built. It's going to be built probably after the time of the Gentiles is, is completed. And they need the Ark of the Covenant. They want the Ark of the Covenant because they're going to follow all the old rules and regulations and make sacrifices the way they did prior to the church age that we're in. Right? Okay. So now here's this man minding his own business. He's there. Well, you know what? In 1982, digging, digging, going in underneath, he made other discoveries as well. I think Val and Steve, you watched that presentation, didn't you, about it? Or Val did. I sent it to Val. Okay, she looked at it. 
It's an amazing, amazing, amazing presentation. But anyways, he discovered that where he was digging above, where he was digging, he first of all, he found uh, places where crosses were, like you have the crosses where people were crucified. They would dig out the rock so that when they put the wood in, like there's so many rocks around Israel, right? It's rocky, rocky territory. So they didn't have to pour cement, which they didn't have in that day. They just dug out in the rock. And they could see where the crosses had been. And he began to think, well, this looks like where they crucified Jesus. And other people began to believe that as well. Like he was talking to different scholars. And he says, I think this is where the crucifixion took place, which was right above where he was digging underneath. So then he starts digging, 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 and he comes upon the Ark of the Covenant. What a journey it was to get in to see the Ark of the Covenant. I'm not going to tell you all that took place, but when he found the Ark of the Covenant on the mercy seat, he found dried blood. It looked like dried blood. He wasn't sure. It could have been animal's blood. It could have been anything, right? He didn't know. It had been there. If it was human blood, it would have been there a long time because this was the Ark of the Covenant. He knew it was the Ark of the Covenant. And he took samples of that blood, and he took it to a lab. And I'm going to just let you listen to what he says. Still with me? And the reason why is because God came in the flesh. He was a man. He had a human body. This was a mystery that Paul had revelation of. And as this man, Ronald Wyatt, was getting more revelation, he was digging into the pomegranate and getting more understanding. He didn't do it because he wanted to. He did it because he was being led of the Holy Ghost. And remember Pastor Nita's message last week? If you're not going anywhere, you don't need any signs along the way. But if you're going somewhere, you need a sign. And he had signs that led him on this path. And so now here he is with scrapings of what he thinks is blood. And I'll, hopefully you can hear this. Listen close. First of all, in this analysis, I took the blood into a laboratory in Israel. I asked one of the people I work with in antiquities, where is a good laboratory that does reliable work? And they said, such and such, such and such. I took it. I just said, please examine this blood and tell me what you can tell me about it. All right? They said, well, look, we're going to reconstitute it. We're going to put it in normal saline and keep it at body temperature for 72 hours with uh, gentle swirling. All right? That's their business. That's great. I said, now, I want to be there when you check it out. They said, fine. So I was back. They checked it out. I said, now, uh, they said it's human blood. We can tell that. They did whatever tests they need to do. And then I said, take some of the white blood cells and put them in a growth medium and keep them at body temperature for 48 hours. And they said, well, that'll do no good because it's dead blood. I said, would you please do that for me? And they said, okay, we'll do it. So anyway, I said, I want to be there when you take it out and examine it. So I was back there. They took it out, examined it under the microscope, and the one technician called the other one over there, and then they called the boss over there, and they were talking Hebrew a mile a minute there for a little bit, and they looked at me, and they said, Mr. Wyatt, this human blood only has 24 chromosomes in it. Everybody else has 46. You see, 23 from your mother, 23 from your father, 22 autosomes from your mother, 22 autosomes from your father. You get an X from your mother, you may get an X or a Y from your father, all right? This blood had 23 chromosomes from the mother's side, one Y chromosome only. You see, the ch a child could not have developed if they hadn't had the autosomes from the mother. So all of his physical characteristics were determined by his mother's side of the family, her autosomes. His maleness was determined by this one Y that came from the source, not a human male. 
then they said, this blood is alive. And then they said, whose blood is this? I said, it's the blood of your Messiah. Powerful. It's the blood of your Messiah. His blood speaks a better word. It was a mystery. There was Ron Wyatt doing what God called him to do. And there he had a mystery uncovered about the blood. And why is that so important to us today? Why is it so important? Because, you know, people don't believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. And the fact that God was his father meant that the sins of the father could not be transferred down. That curse from Adam was not allowed to pass down through the bloodline to the Messiah, to Jesus. He had God's, Yahweh's DNA on the inside of him. He had the characteristics of Mary. So that just thrilled me. That just thrills me. So now, going back to the incarnation of The mystery of the incarnation. Well, there's probably going to be more things that we discover about the blood. We sing there's power in the blood. Well, Paul says that's a powerful thing for the church to get a hold of. And he says it, he was preached among the Gentiles. This message was preached among the Gentiles. Now, the message of the blindness of Israel. And this is what I've read to you now before, and I'm going to read it again, Romans 11:25. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. So what's he saying? Don't be ignorant of this mystery. I want you to have understanding of this. So the mysteries are made to be understood, but you have to dig it out. Search out the matter. Be, have a king's heart. Amen? He says, least you should be wise in your own opinion. How many people are wise in their own opinion? He says, I don't want you to be ignorant of things. But he says, you know what? The blindness, in part, has happened to Israel. There's been a temporary blindness in Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. It just means there's an expiry date and there's a period end of when the church is going to come to an end. Not come to an end, we're going to relocate. That's probably a more accurate way of putting it. So that's a wonderful mystery to think about. Okay? Got that one? So there's a blindness... Paul said it. That was a mystery that was revealed to him. Now, the mystery of the church is that the Gentiles were included. Well, of course, here we go again. Paul, he just goes, oh, the Gentiles, the Gentiles, the Gentiles, the Gentiles. I was called as a minister. But that was the huge revelation. I mean, even Peter had to get it. He had to have a vision from heaven. And then he had to go to Cornelius' house, and he had to see it for himself, that really the Gentiles were included in this thing called the church. God was doing something new. It wasn't ever going to be the same. Okay? So Ephesians 3, 1 to 10, uh, he says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, he's in prison for them, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed by the Holy Spirit to the apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister, according to the gift of grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. He's, I've been set aside. This has been the job God's given to me by his grace and by his power. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God. This was all hidden in Christ before the foundation of time. Jesus loved you while you were yet a sinner, right? Before the foundation of time, this mystery was hidden. The devil had no clue of what the church was going to be all about. Okay. 
He created all things through Jesus Christ to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. So the mystery of the church is that God's taking Jews and Gentiles, making one new man out of them, empowering them with the Holy Spirit to show off and put the powers and principalities of darkness to shame. That's a, yeah, that's a pretty good mystery. It was, it was kept hidden in Christ for ages, and it was revealed. Paul says, I'm revealing this to you. They had no clue. Can you imagine? They were synagogue boys. They had no clue of what the church was supposed to be. It took this learned man spending time with Holy Spirit to bring this revelation to them. And we get to partake of that revelation today. It's wonderful. Amen? Okay. So now, the mystery of the indwelling Christ. That's Colossians 1, 24 to 27. And he says, this mystery, which has been hidden from ages and from generations, that was hidden again, he says this, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. He says it again. Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Do we sing that? We have... Let him in, we sang this morning, but let him out. What? Let him in and let him out? Well, we, we let Holy Spirit in when we say yes to Jesus. He comes in. That was a mystery. That had never happened before. People had no, people had no clue what had taken place in, in, inside of them, that it was really a deposit of the Holy Spirit. Now, that happened to me when I was born again. I obediently, with my aunts, she prayed with me, and she said, would you like to accept Christ? And I did. There were circumstances that led me to that prayer, and I invited Jesus in. Well, I knew something had happened, but I had no understanding of it. And when I got reading the Word, as she told me, my aunt told me to start doing, I can remember reading, we have the Spirit of God on the inside of us as a witness. His Spirit bears witness to our spirit. And I went, that's what happened to me. The Holy Spirit came into me when I read it in the Word. Then understanding came. That's Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's a huge mystery. We, we are containers of the glory of God. And what does that mean? What does it mean to be a container of the glory of God? That, well, we get to find out. Now, Paul, he does say in Romans, we were talking about this at Bible study, and if you haven't come, please come. We need you there on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. But he says, if that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, Jesus in you, the hope of glory, he says, you know what's going to happen? It's going to cause a quickening. That same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, it took dunamis power. What power did it take to raise Christ from the dead? Well, that dwells in you. What a mystery. What a mystery. And it's going to cause a quickening to your body. Is it just to make you go, ooh, I felt a goosebump. Is that what it's in there for? No, it's to equip you. It's to make you realize he is on the inside of you. He's going to cause a quickening to your spirit, and you're going to be like a Ron Wyatt. You're going to be on a journey because, like Pastor says, if you're not going anywhere, you don't need a sign, but you're going to have signs, and you've probably had a few signs that you're heading in the right direction or going in the wrong direction. Amen? So that's the mystery of the indwelling of Christ. I have to keep going here fast. The mystery of the headship of Christ. That's number five. This is interesting um, because he talks about a marriage relationship. And Paul in Romans 7 does the same thing. We think he's doing a teaching on marriage, but he's really not. He's using the analogy of a marriage, which is covenant. And every person of that day in that culture understood covenant. So when we read this, it says, wives submit to your husbands. Well, really, Paul's just saying, I want to teach you something about the mystery of the church. And he goes on to say that. He says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So let's listen to what he says. Wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. So now put the emphasis in the right place. Understand he's talking covenant marriage relationship, but the emphasis should be on what the mystery is and what, 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 what the meaning of the church is. Okay? 
He says, so let wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your... Oh, I think I missed a line. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. Just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Do you hear the emphasis now? Okay, that's what he's talking about. Don't talk about marriage and whatnot. You can get some truths out of there, but that's not Paul's intent. He says he wants you to see that you're in a covenant relationship, and it's just like marriage. And isn't that what Jesus talked about just before he came back? He says, I'm coming back for my bride. My bride is the church, and that's you, and the Gentiles are included. And anyone who can believe in Jesus is included. doesn't matter what race, creed, color, whatever, Right? You say yes to Jesus, you're in, and he's in. Believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. Amen? All right. So the mystery of the translation of the church. Now it's getting good. What's the mystery of the translation of the church? This is another mystery. Paul didn't get this from anyone. He got it from the Holy Ghost. And what does he say? In 1 Corinthians 15, 50 to 57. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. He's going to tell you the mystery. Okay, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. And he goes on to say a few more things. But, well, what is that talking about? It pertains to the church. It's a mystery. He didn't have a mystery just for anyone. It was a mystery that pertained to the church. And this is a mystery that takes place in the twinkling of an eye. It's not visible to the whole world. Anybody ever seen a twinkle of an eye? It's going to happen real quick. We're all going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And this is the wonderful hope. It's the blessed hope of the church, Peter says, right? And that's called the rapture of the church. Now, when do you think the time of the Gentiles is going to end? If it, enter, if it entered in with, at Pentecost, let's, let's just talk. When do you think the time of the Gentiles is going to end? When's it going to end? It began at Pentecost. Where is it going to end? Remember, the time of the Gentiles has to be fulfilled. There's an expiry date on the time of the Gentiles. When do you think it's going to end? The church began at Pentecost. We weren't a church before Pentecost. We were just believers. There were believers in Jesus, Jewish believers. But the revelation came to Paul that there was going to be something that was going to occur that's going to be a mystery. It's a wonderful mystery. But he's talking about, in the twinkling of an eye, the translation of the church. Okay? Can you believe that the church is going to end or relocate at the rapture? Our church preaches that we believe in the rapture. Whenever that's going to take place. Right? So when the church goes, right? When the church goes, what's going to be happening on planet Earth? Well, we have some understanding through the word of what's going to take place, and that's the final mystery. The final mystery is the mystery of lawlessness. Luke 21, 24 talks about that. No, sorry. Second Th- sorry, I read the wrong line. The mystery of lawlessness is 2 Thessalonians 2, 7. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. So I'm just sort of unpackaging this. Who's going to be taken out of the way? Lawlessness is in the world. Has has lawlessness been around since, since time began? And it's going to keep going 
says, until he is taken out of the way. And then Paul goes on in Thessalonians to talk about what takes place. Then, he says, when, when he is taken out of the way, which I believe the he is Holy Spirit and the church, when we get raptured, then what's going to happen is there's going to be a revelation of what's called the Antichrist. So Paul goes on and he describes that in 2 Thessalonians. So you go ahead and you search that out and see if it doesn't say exactly what I said. So today I've come to say there's mysteries that were hidden in Christ. There's an expiry date for the church. Jesus is coming back for his bride. We are his bride. We are in covenant with him if you have Jesus on the inside of you. That's the hope of glory. Paul gives us seven things that talk about the Gentiles included, Jesus in us, in a twinkling of an eye we're going to be changed, these wonderful mysteries that tell us that the church age is going to come to an end, and all that we have to do is be ready for that event. He says, just keep learning and loving the Lord. <clears throat> and <clears throat> years ago, however many years, I, I maybe haven't got this right, but there was a commercial on TV that talked about uh, <clears throat> pardon me, a mystery all wrapped up in a conundrum. Does anybody remember that commercial? Oh. I know. It, it, I looked up the word conundrum, and it means a, conf a confusing or difficult problem or question, some confusion. And I've come to believe that, you know what, you have the Holy Ghost on the inside of you. You guys are conundrums. <laughs> but you're wrapped up, in, you're, inside of you is a mystery wrapped up. There's a mystery all wrapped up in a conundrum. I think the, the biggest mystery, this is just me and my, if, if I was going to do some writings, I think the biggest mystery is the fact that Jesus loved us enough to say he wanted us for a bride, that he picked us before the foundation of time, and that he says he's going to come for us again and says, get ready, I'm coming for my bride. It's not been appointed unto you to suffer wrath. So he's put these wonderful mysteries, but you are that mystery as well. You are a mystery all wrapped up in a conundrum. Amen? You've got Holy Ghost on the inside of you. And don't underestimate what he wants to do in you and through you. If you've never asked Jesus to come in, invite him in. If you've been heading like Paul in the wrong direction, change course. Just say, I'm going to follow Jesus. As for me, I'm going, to, I'm going to serve the Lord. Be a real conundrum to your family, because you know when you start serving Jesus, they look at you and they look, you are a conundrum. You are a mystery wrapped up in a conundrum. And you can say, amen to that. That's me. I have Holy Ghost on the inside of me. So hopefully some of these mysteries have been unwrapped a little bit, and I want you just to be thinking about the times of the Gentiles, because there is an expiry date for the church. This is not going to go on and on forever. But before that comes, there's the promise of revival. And our pastor, she has had that in her heart as long as I have known her. That's been in her heart. See, Ron Wyatt had something in his heart, and he followed his journey. He followed his signs. And it took him on a wonderful journey of discovery of the Ark of the Covenant. Pastor Anita, she just keeps believing and pressing in to revival, 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 revival. We're having revival. Glory to God. She's going to get us revived and ready for the return of Christ. She sees this church filled. She's had visions of that. That's her calling. That's her walk. That's the mystery that's on the inside of her. I want to teach everybody. That's a mystery. When I'm at work, I didn't want to teach a soul about x-ray. Leave me alone. Don't let me be the one to teach you. But when it comes to the word, you can't stop me. It's like that's, that, that was a mystery to me. Who, who would have thought that? Amen? So what, what kind of a mystery is on the inside of you? Amen. Sir Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's just close our eyes and pray. Father, thank you for this word. I pray, Lord, that it would just unveil. It would just be like that pomegranate. We dig in and see all that's there. We get juicy and messy, and maybe those, beads, those seeds will just squirt all over the place. Maybe some of them will get trampled down. But, Father, we're going to learn and grow. We're going to learn and we're going to grow. And thank you that Paul served you wholeheartedly. Lord, he served you wholeheartedly. 
And he certainly was a mystery to those around him, Father. He went one direction 100%, and then he went in another direction. Wow, he was a mystery wrapped up in a conundrum. Hallelujah. And Lord, I pray that each one of us would fulfill what you've called us and purposed us to do. We don't have to be like anyone else. We just have to be like who you created us to be and say yes to your invitation. And I pray that we'd not turn down your invitation. Hallelujah. We'd not miss the day of your visitation in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now my hubby, he's got a different calling than I do. He's a bookkeeper. He's, he's got giftings that I don't need to have. And I love what he does. He spends a lot of time for you people. And, I, and I, want, I want you to know that. I respect him and honor him. He spends lots of time at the computer. You know you get those receipts for your income tax. Well, that just doesn't happen. And he's keeping books all along and ledgers. And once a year, he has to make a presentation about the finances of the church. And I think you're going to be absolutely blessed by this. You're being given a, a little sheet of paper here that gives us that information. Don't go putting it on YouTube or sharing it. This is in-house, right? And before we sing that last song and we finish the service, um, Doug is just going to take a few minutes to make that presentation that he has to make legally, by law, once a year. All righty? You are very welcome. You are welcome.